together. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Please be seated as we welcome Pastor Chue for today's message. Thank you, Song Tiam and the music team for leading us in the time of musical worship. We continue our worship in the listening to God's Word. And our scripture passage for today comes from John chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. Allow me to read it for us. Hear now the word of the Lord, John chapter 10, beginning from verse 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we begin a, a series of four weeks where we will talk about the favourite topic of the church, giving. Okay, some laughters, others... Lost joke. Um, but I have heard it said before. I wonder whether you have heard it said before also or asked, um, uh, particularly by non Christians, but there are some Christians who ask it also. Then they ask, why do churches keep asking people to give money? Uh, some even ask, or some have asked their children who want to become a Christian. If you, want, if you become a Christian, uh, does that mean you must give money to the church? And then there are also some who think that when churches touch on topics and we use words like stewardship or generosity, that these are just euphemisms. They're euphemisms to mask the bottom line message. Give the church your money. Well, every year at around this time in our church, we observe a month called Stewardship Month and today kicks off that period of four weeks. And in this period we will touch on financial matters of the church, including the budget that we are anticipating to continue the ministries of the church in the next financial year. Uh, and we will also then be calling on all of us to make a pledge to the Lord to give towards the life and the work of this church. So yes, we are going to ask you to give money. But preaching about money, you know, and asking people to give can be misconstrued in so many ways especially since the income of our preachers and the pastors, in fact, comes from your giving. In the recent decade, also, the church in Singapore has received bad press. Even as uh, one church that is known for its strong message on giving was found guilty of misappropriation of funds. So really, if there's any doubt in your minds, we don't really like to ask people to give money. The pastors don't, the preachers don't. So why do we talk about giving? Well, because on one hand, preaching on giving money towards the church serves a very practical necessity. Because in this world economy, we have a Chinese saying, uh, and it goes like this, So not everything can be accomplished with money, but without money, much cannot be accomplished. And... Even in the New Testament, we see that even the spiritual giant, Paul, the one who, could, um, who people took the handkerchief that he prayed over and, and they went to other places and he healed people, even this spiritual giant, Paul, had to conduct a fundraising exercise to provide help to a church in another region which was facing famine. And so as long as we are living in this world economy, the church will need money to carry out its divine mission of proclaiming the gospel of God's kingdom. Uh, I have a lecturer who once told me that he got very upset when he, uh, when in his uh, church's board meeting and they were discussing the, how much they should uh, give to their missionaries and, and how much a monthly salary or income they should give to the missionaries and it was low and he was so upset and he made this very poignant statement to them. Do you know what? 
a can of Coke will cost the same to you as well as to the missionary. How much do you think you should give them? So in this world economy, money um, seems to be a practical necessity. So on the one hand, we may preach about that. The church may want to talk about giving money because it serves a practical necessity. But on the other hand, and this reason is more crucial than practical necessity, more crucial than practical necessity is that we are compelled by the Word of God, the Scriptures, to talk about giving. And yes, to exhort giving, and yes, to exhort about giving money. Not just your time, not just your efforts, but money. Yes, the church needs money for its ministries, but you know what? Frankly, the church, the church's ministry can carry on in some measures even without a building even without all these facilities and administrations that we are so used to. We don't really need an air-conditioned hall to worship. The early church met in homes, in small groups, and it grew. The founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, was denied a parish, and therefore he had no sanctuary to preach in, and so he preached outdoors. And as he preached outdoors, a spiritual revival spread through the land. Yes, from human wisdom, perhaps more can be done when there is money. But honestly, the church will not die. And ministry in the name of Christ will not cease totally for lack of money. And sometimes it may even be the lack of money that God uses to shake a sleepy church awake to spark a renewal movement in the church. And if it comes to it, God can most definitely provide funds for the church through other means. So yes, there are practical needs for money for the church, but they are not the primary reason why we talk about giving money in church. The primary and compelling reason is not practical necessity, but spiritual necessity. So we are compelled to talk about it by Scripture. And Scripture warns that money is one of those things that has a special power to turn even saints into devils. It is one of those things that can insidiously become an idol in your life and then keep or turn you away from God and jeopardize your eternal destiny. Jesus would explicitly and specifically warn his followers, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And following Jesus, the Apostle Paul would warn also explicitly and very specifically, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Jesus and his apostles preached so strongly on the topic of money because worshipping money leads to death, while worshipping God leads to life. And Jesus really, really, really wants all of us to choose life, not death. And to be sure, money in itself is valueless and it is powerless. Can you say that to one another? Money is valueless and powerless. And let that sink in. Now give me all your money. It is valueless and powerless. Okay, I mean, that's a joke aside. Um, but you know, in itself, money has no value. It carries a number that enables you to exchange it for something that has real use and real value. In itself, it has no value. It is we, human society, that has given it value. And to prove a point, you take your Singapore dollar and you go to Malaysia, no matter how strong your dollar is, and you try to buy something over the counter. Maybe some will accept like, because it's a stronger dollar, right? Uh, but chances are they also won't accept. They'll ask you to go and change it to Malaysian ringgit first. Your money has no value. It is human society that gives it its value. And it, money has become so valuable in our lives because now without it, we cannot obtain most material things needed for our sustenance and many material things we desire for our enjoyment. And just as the value of money is given by men, the power of money is also given by men. We give power to money to control our lives when we desire money. And some have rightly said that money is like fire. It is a good 
servant, but a terrible master. The more we desire money, the more power we give to it, the more we are enslaved by it, and the more wretched it makes us. And the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, observed this statement to be true towards the end of his life, that the more we have money, the more wretched it makes us. It was on August 4th, 1786. He was nearing the end of his life and he had started a, um, God had used him to start uh, the Methodist movement in the UK. It was spreading. And, but as he looked at the Methodist movement in 1786, about 50 plus years after he, he went on fire for the Lord, John Wesley observed something and he penned his concern for the state of Methodism because he was observing this. Though the Methodist movement had grown steadily, he was beginning to see signs of the danger of its decline. Wesley noticed that values of honest hard work and frugality, thrift, resulted from the Methodist faith in Jesus. And because of hard work and frugality, the Methodists were growing richer. And because they were growing richer, he noticed that they then, and I quote, increased in pride, in anger, in the desires of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life. Unquote. And so, although they were still practicing the disciplines in Methodism, the true spirit of Methodism was swiftly vanishing. And it was a conundrum. True religion turns people away from pride and sin. Turning away from pride and sin made people grow in favour with others and in their riches. Growing in favour and riches made people proud. It's a conundrum. The very thing that is supposed to turn you away from death is leading you to death. How can any revival of true religion continue long? And Wesley concluded like this, Is there no way to prevent this? this continual decline or declension of pure religion. We ought not to forbid people to be diligent and frugal. We should be encouraging people to be this. We must exhort all Christians to gain all they can and to save all they can. That is, in fact, to grow rich. So if you want to grow rich, quote John Wesley, we must encourage all of us to grow rich. But then he asked, what way then, I ask again, can we take that our money may not sink us to the nethermost hell? There is one way and there is no other under heaven. If those who gain all they can and save all they can will likewise give all they can, then the more they gain, the more they will grow in grace and the more treasure they will lay up in heaven. Friends, there is only one way that our money may not sink us to the nethermost hell. And that is if we are diligent in giving all we can. Wesley was bringing to bear and he was prescribing Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 34. In that passage, Jesus taught his followers not to be anxious about gathering money. and Instead, he instructed them to practice giving money, to keep their hearts focused on God. Luke chapter 12 also reveals a paradox. The world thinks that having more money means having more freedom. And then they become more and more anxious about gathering money. But those who have learned to give generously, while perhaps they end up with less material wealth, they enjoy the freedom and peace that everyone seeks. So giving is a spiritual discipline. It is a means. You might even call it a gift from God that God has given to us to guard against money from becoming our idol. And in our sermon series for this Stewardship Month, we will see how the discipline of giving not only guards us from the idolatry of money, at the same time, it helps us to grow spiritually as true sons and daughters of God in the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving helps us to grow in humility, helps us to grow in faith, it helps us to grow in contentment, and it helps us to grow in generosity. These concepts and these ideas, they are not new or they are not uh, treasured only by the Christian faith. You ask even an atheist and they will say that these ideals are good. The question is, how do you grow in them? The Christian says giving helps us to grow in them. And today we touch on giving helps us to grow in humility. And we remember that humility is one of our church's higher values that God is leading us to grow in. And humility is so important, isn't it? The opposite of humility is pride or arrogance. 
And many Christian thinkers since ancient times have observed that the first sin, the very first sin, or some call it the original sin, the root of all sins, is pride. It was pride that turned Lucifer from being an archangel of God to an archenemy of God. He would not accept his place as a creature subordinate to his creator and sought to overthrow God. And to stir up God's beloved people against him, the very ploy of Lucifer, whom we now know as Satan, was to stir up the pride of men. He incited the first man and uh, woman, Adam and Eve. He incited them to doubt God's goodness and well intent by lying to them that God was keeping something good from them something that would make them equal to him. And that stirred up pride within them. How can God keep something good from me? And pride once stirred would turn best friends into worst enemies. We see that to be true not only in humanity's relationship with God, but also in our own relationships, isn't it? We dislike being around proud people. We find them boastful, arrogant, unteachable, not open to feedback or correction. They are always thinking that they are in the right. And when we try to tell them something, they immediately defend themselves. They are defensive, etc., etc., etc. How many of you have known people like that and you really cannot, you dislike being around people like that? Thank you. I don't. But you know what? Even as we agree uh, that uh, even as we agree about all these things, if we are not careful, our dislike of a proud person may be, may be, because we ourselves are proud. We hate it that this person that I see as proud, we hate it that he or she will not listen to me. We hate it when they will not acknowledge that I am better than them, and etc., etc., etc. Pride not only destroys relationships, pride stirs up pride in others. And so whenever there is a break in a relationship, chances are pride is at play. Pride propagates pride. How great a sin pride is. And the cure to pride is humility. The thing that will stop pride from propagating is humility. The thing that will save us from pride is humility. The thing that will save our relationships with one another is humility. When people refuse to listen to one another, in order to break that, one party must start listening to the other. But the very thing the very humility that will save us is also the very thing that eludes us. We cannot attain it because pride resides in us. Pride is the very thing that will keep pride from being rooted out. We cannot overcome our pride on our own. Something external must expose the pride in us. Something external of us must humble us for humility to fill us and then empty us of our pride. And so while the world tells you that you can save yourself by your own efforts, Christianity's message is that you are just not good enough. You will never be good enough to save yourself. No matter how good or perfect you think you may be, you have fallen way short of God's standards of what it means to be good and righteous and fit to live with Him in heaven. But Christianity also says that there is good news. Good news. God can and God has worked to save you. God has and has worked to save you. God wants to help you and God will save you. Now, can anyone accept that? Can, you, can anyone accept all of this? Will you accept that you are inferior and you are subordinate in every way to God? Will you accept that your eternal destiny is ultimately not in your hands, but in God's? Will you accept that you need the help of God to be saved? To acknowledge inferiority and needing help is humbling. Accepting God's salvation requires humility, and remaining in God's salvation requires humility. 
The Proverbs warn us pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Have I? Yeah. If you do not want to fall in life and in salvation, but you wish to stand firm in life and faith, you need humility. And this is the importance of humility. And one way that God has given to us to grow in humility is through the spiritual discipline of giving. But before we get into how giving helps us to grow in humility, we must first be mindful that not all kinds of giving helps us to grow in humility. There are kinds of giving that do the opposite. There are kinds of giving that makes us more arrogant and boastful. There are kinds of giving that make us grow not as children of God, but as enemies of God. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. In Luke 18, Jesus also told a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they, are, that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Jesus said, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you, I'm not like the other men. Or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. Giving that breeds contempt. And Jesus exposed such misguided giving and condemned this kind of giving as hypocritical. These kinds of giving stem from pride and they increase pride. If we desire to give in a way that helps us to grow in humility, then beware first of practicing such kinds of giving. Be self-aware of our motives when giving. So putting that aside now, now then what type of giving helps us to grow in humility? Well, it is a giving that is ultimately motivated by the grace of God found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. When God tells you that you need help, that you cannot help yourself, that only He can help you, and that He loves you so much that He will help you at the cost of even His life, there are essentially three ways, I think maybe even only three ways, ultimately to respond to this message from God. The first is that you are offended that someone, even God, would judge you to be not good enough and that you need His help, and then your pride hardens. First way. Second way, you think that you're so good that even God cannot but desire to serve and help you, and your pride and your ego hardens. The third way, you are humbled that the Son of God would give His life to save you. Your pride is softened. You begin to trust and you begin to follow God in His way to true life. Giving that flows from the third response is a type of giving that helps us to grow in humility. Because you know that your giving did not start with you and therefore you have nothing to be proud about or boast about. Giving that starts with humility grows humility. And as we look to Jesus' way of giving, we see Jesus' self-giving to lay down his life for his sheep. That is to sacrifice and to give his life to save all of us from eternal death to eternal life. And we are humbled. And in humility, to trust and follow him, to grow again further in humility, is to follow in his way of giving. So what type of giving did Jesus um, engage in? Well, firstly, we can follow Jesus in giving as an initiative of the free will rather than as a response to fear, coercion, or emotional blackmail. In our scripture reading today, we heard Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus gave his life for us, not because someone, uh, not even because God the Father coerced him to. He also did not lay down his life for us because he was afraid that we would think badly about him. Sometimes we give, isn't it, because we are afraid how people will think of us if we don't give. Well, Jesus was neither coerced nor was he emotionally blackmailed to. He gave it on his own accord. We could not save ourselves and he took 
the initiative to give his life to save us. When we take the initiative to give, we humble ourselves to consider the needs of others even before they ask. The second way to give, to grow in humility, is to give with genuine care for the recipient. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus gave his life for us because he cares for us. And out of his care, his focus on giving was not on how much he should give or how much he should not give. Instead, his focus on what we actually needed. When we give, do we think foremostly about the amount that we are giving? Should I give this amount? Should I give that amount? Or do we ask it in another way? Do we consider what the recipient really needs? Do we ask first, what does this person need? Do we give to help to the best that we can? Or do we give in tokenism? When we give with genuine care, we learn to be humble in considering the needs of the recipient before our personal comfort. The third way to give is to give in a measure that actually costs us something. Don't give your spare change. Jesus laid down his life for us. There is no greater giving than that. And the truth is we spend money on people in proportion to how much we value them. And that's why most people will have no qualms about spending $20 on a meal for themselves, but will not even think to offer a $5 meal to a stranger begging for money for food. Because we often value ourselves over the other. When we give in a measure that actually means we have to forgo something of real value to ourselves, we express in that instance that we have valued the person at least to how much we value ourselves. It is written and Jesus affirmed, love your neighbour as yourself. When we give in such a manner, we grow in humility by honouring and valuing the recipient the same way we honour and we value ourselves. The fourth way of giving is to give without discrimination. Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. Jesus did not discriminate between the sheep which are Jews and the sheep which are Gentiles. He laid down his life for all in the world without discrimination. We have a tendency to give only to those whom we judge to be deserving, the causes that we judge to be deserving, and we withhold our giving from those we judge otherwise. Pride puts us above others, judges and condemns. Humility brings us down alongside others, joins with them, and lifts them up. Fifth and sixth ways, we just mentioned quickly, giving without expectation of return or reward, giving at the risk of rejection or abuse. Now, these two types of giving are related. Pride will give only if giving will benefit or elevate me. Pride will not stand for rejection because rejection means you have rejected me. And pride will not stand for even the slightest possibility of being abused because that would mean you have won over me. But humility sees the risk of rejection or abuse. Humility sees the risk of giving anyway because you see a person and you care enough to want to give, to bless him or her, even while recognizing the risks. The seventh way, finally, giving in gratitude and obedience to God. Giving helps us to grow in humility when it is an act of gratitude and obedience. Gratitude is humbling because it admits when you thank someone, you are admitting that we needed the benefit we received from that person. And obedience is humbling because it admits that there is someone who is above us to whom we must submit to and give an account to. And giving in gratitude and obedience really is a command from God. It is affirmed in Jesus. It is not a command from a tyrannical God who commands us to give so that your gift, so that I don't need to give. That's not God. But giving is a command from a gracious God, the gracious God, who has first given to us. 
even his life for us. So I submit these seven ways of giving in order for us to grow in humility for your consideration. And for us to just ask, maybe I cannot work on all seven, but is there one of them that I can work on today? I'm going to close with this. In the 1830s, a Scottish minister, Robert Murray uh, McShane, preached this, and I quote, Now, dear Christians, some of you pray night and day to be made branches of the true vine. You pray to be made all over in the image of Christ. If so, you must be like him in giving. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes, he became poor. Objection! My money is my own. Answer, Christ might have said, my blood is my own, my life is my own. No man forced it from me. Then, where would you and I have been? Objection, the poor are undeserving. Answer, Christ might have said the same thing. They are wicked rebels against my father's law. Shall I lay down my life for these? I will give to the good angels. But no, he gave his blood for the undeserving. Objection! The poor may abuse it. Answer, Christ might have said the same, yeah, with far greater truth. Christ knew that thousands would trample his blood under their feet, that most would despise it, that many would make it an excuse for sinning more. Yet, he gave his own blood. Oh, my dear Christians, if you would be like Christ, give much. Give often, give freely the vile and the poor, the thankless and the undeserving. Christ is glorious and happy, and so will you be. It is not your money that I want, it is your happiness. Remember his own word, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Friends, when God calls us to give, it is not your money that he wants. What he wants is your happiness. He's not asking you to give up your happiness, he's wanting for you to be happy. And that's why He calls you to give. And so why do we talk about giving? Well, God wants you to have true happiness, freedom and peace in your life. Things you will never have when money is your idol and goal in life. Things you will never have when pride remains in you. And humility is a foundation for freedom, for peace, for happiness. Giving in humility grows us in humility. And the only way we can truly give in humility is when we look to the cross of Jesus and we see that God is the first giver, a giver even of his life to save yours. And we are just servants of his and stewards of all that he has given to us. So because God has given, let us go and do likewise. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Father in heaven, because you gave your son Jesus for our sakes, we are humbled. And so by the grace that you have given to us, inspire us, push us, compel us even by love to give for the sake of your glory, for the sake of your kingdom, that many may know you that many may rejoice in you. And in giving, O Lord, we pray that you'll grow us in humility so that we may always, always walk in step with you and never before you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for the message.